In this edition of In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, we catch up with the legendary Boomer Esiason, who I affectionately called the Blonde Bombshell. This guy was an unbelievable football player, and he led the Cincinnati Bengals to very, very big heights, Super Bowl twenty-three in 1988, MVP of the league. And doing this with Boomer, it fired me up. I mean, I felt like playing again. I could tell Boomer felt like playing again. I mean, it, it rekindles that a competitive spirit. And to hear Boomer talk about Joe Burrow and the respect that he has for Joe Burrow and watching the Cincinnati Bengals this season and how exciting a football team, how entertaining, how much fun it is to be a Cincinnati Bengal fan again. It got me all fired up. There's no doubt about it. I think it'll fire you up too. You'll enjoy it. Welcome once again to In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, brought to you by First Star Logistics. We're in our gaming studios as always, and our very special guest today is the man, the legend, Boomer <laughs> Siasen, the blonde bombshell, as I fondly called the man, the legend. Boomer, what do you think? What the heck is the deal with Joe Burrow? The last two games, Boomer Siasen, Joe Burrow has thrown the football for a ridiculous number, 971 yards, eight touchdowns, no interceptions in two football games. Unbelievable. Yes. unbelievable. Yeah, it is unbelievable, but, you know, it's great. It's great to see, and uh, he's really coming to his own. Uh, I think the most important thing, Dave, and you and I talked about this when the season started, you know, was the leader uh, that he is, uh, the way that he carries himself. Uh, I'd like to say this in a very nice way but because I believe I possess some of this trait myself, oh. you got to have a little red ass in your quarterback, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and what that means, and what that means is he's got to feel like, you know, he's the man. Yep. Uh, he doesn't really show it all the time. It's interesting because here in New York, uh, people really don't know Joe Burrow. Uh, they don't, they see his post-game interviews. Uh, they don't watch all their games. Uh, they don't really see – you know, some of the other things that you're probably privy to because you see him every day and you're around him the entire season. But I tell people all the time, don't be uh, swayed by the fact that he's a SpongeBob SquarePants fan and he's a Nickelodeon fan and he buys into the slime time and all that other stuff. Right. Uh, he is an extremely competitive young man. And I remember talking about him two years ago before the Bengals drafted him and what I was uh, predicting that he would end up going to the Bengals with the number one overall pick. You know, he was an all-state point guard. Uh, yep. in Athens, Ohio. Yep. And if you're a point guard and you're an all-state point guard in the state of Ohio, that means, you know what, you're a pretty competitive dude. You're you're a guy that can see the court. You're the guy that can score when you need to score. You're the guy that wants the ball in his hands. And that's all the, all the, the attributes that you want in your quarterback. And uh, you and I both know what kind of leader he is. We also know what kind of, um, you know, uh, I would say self-awareness he has. And, uh, and how good he really, truly can be. So, like I said earlier, tip of the iceberg um, for him. I think the future is exceptionally bright, and the guy's going to be worth over $300 million uh, in a relatively short period of time, <laughs> if not more than that. Unbelievable. It really is amazing. So it seems to me that he has got this trait that the great ones, and I'm talking, you know, Michael Jordan is probably the greatest example where – He's going to prove people wrong. He feeds off of, fuels off of the negative. One, one person may have a negative comment or doubt uh, something about Michael Jordan. He would use that to fuel him to like unbelievable highs. Joe Burrow seems to be the same way. And the latest example is, okay, he wasn't real, like you said, outwardly verbal about the Pro Bowl. But I think he thought, you know what? I, might have, I, I think I get snubbed here a little bit. I'm going to prove people wrong. The two games since the Pro Bowl voting happened, 971, eight touchdowns, no interceptions. I think he uses that stuff to fuel to fuel himself. You know, I'm going to show these people they were wrong. <laughs> well, you know, the Pro Bowl is really a popularity contest. And, you know, I don't think the, the players put as much time and effort in, into it as they should. You know, I'm an AP all pro uh, voter and I put uh, – 
an enormous amount of time in making sure that I believe that I have the right guys at the right positions yep. representing representing the best, the very best of the best. So whatever really motivates you and floats your boat, you know, whether it be Tom Brady being a six round draft pick or me being a second round draft pick or Joe being snubbed for the Pro Bowl. Uh, you know, whatever really gets you going, that's all that really matters. And by the way, the Pro Bowl voting happens too early. Like, you know, you have seven, you know, uh, you're, we're playing 17 games. Yep. Why after 12 of those games are the votes already in? It, it doesn't make any sense to me because Lamar Jackson doesn't deserve to be in the Pro Bowl. Not because he's not a great player. It's because he hasn't played any games right. uh, over the last five weeks. So, and Joe has really turned it on here the second half of the season. And really, the, the, the thing that they accomplished this past week is they finally won three games in a row. Yep. You know, you would, I, I thought when Cleveland came to Cincinnati, uh, it's probably about a month ago now, and you're thinking, okay, Cincinnati is just ready to turn the corner. And all of a sudden, they turn the ball over on their first two series, and Cleveland, Cleveland runs them out of their own building. You're thinking, ah, they're still too young. They're not gonna, they haven't figured this thing out yet. But I think they learned something about themselves on that uh, road trip to Denver where they won 15 to 10 and it was a really physical game. And it was like Denver was playing as if it was their playoff game and they won that game and then they came home. And I think they finally exhaled Dave and whether it be Joe's chip on his shoulder or whatever it may be, uh, I think they finally figured out, you know, exactly who they are, especially on offense. You know, the thing that they've done in this three game winning streak, Boomer, no turnovers. <clears throat> Zero. I mean, not giving away possessions, not giving the opponent any extra possessions. In the 10 wins the Bengals have right now, they have five giveaways. In the in the uh, six losses, they have 16 giveaways. I mean, sometimes it can be that simple. You know, I mean, taking care of the football, it's a big deal, right? It is. You know, it's interesting. Since Bill Belichick took over as the New England Patriot head coach back in 2000, I think their their turnover differential is like plus 216, okay? Nobody is even remotely close to that over the last 20 years. Nobody. And it is really the key statistic, as long as you have the good players playing the right positions. So if you have a top-flight quarterback and he's not turning it over and he's putting up the numbers that Joe's putting up, it's the number that you can now – go back to and say, okay, this is the number that we can really look at as to whether or not we're a winning team. And that is the turnover differential. So there's no there's no question in my mind that going into that Cleveland game, I figured, okay, they're ready to get going. And then all of a sudden, Joe throws the interception back for a touchdown. Right. Jamar Chase fumbles the ball. And the next thing you know, uh, the momentum goes all the way to the Cleveland sideline. They can't, they can't overcome that. And maybe Zach Taylor, maybe it's the coaches, somebody imparted some wisdom upon the team that, guys, we're good enough to play with anybody as long as we don't give other teams good field position, cheap touchdowns, and really, let's face it, you know, our defense is good, but, it, you know, it's not, it's not a top five defense in this league, so we can't turn it over. Right. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's no, no question about it. That performance – that Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow put on in, in last week's football game. It, it, it was a clinic. I mean, 266 yards receiving by Jamar Chase, setting a new franchise record, single game, 11 catches. And on a lot of the throws, there wasn't huge separation. I mean, they were playing press man coverage, and, and, and really the coverage was pretty decent. But Joe would put it in the only spot that Jamar could make a play on it. And Jamar knew – where Joe was going to put it so he can make a play on it. I've never seen anything <laughs> like it. It's crazy. It's Well, it's one of the reasons why I think the Mingles drafted Jamar. And I know that Joe advocated for them to draft Jamar. Uh, I know that Joe uh, called Jamar the night before and said, get ready to pack your bags. You're coming to Cincinnati. Jamar right. told me this. Right. So uh, they, they knew it was going to happen. And quite frankly, it looks like it was three years ago when they were in LSU. They have a sixth sense and a really close relationship that – you know, it's, it's really showing itself on the field. Uh, you know, the, the one thing I, I do know about uh, Joe Burrow and coming off of that knee injury, not only did he have to put himself through the rehab to get right, he worked very hard in the offseason, you know, throwing the ball and working on accuracy and things of that nature. And then when you see the accuracy numbers oh. over the last two weeks, they're ridiculous. And actually for the entire season, it's not just the last two weeks, but the entire season, you know, he's been amazing with his accuracy and – and, and this is where it really touches me more than anything. 
is the yards per attempt. The yards per attempt shows that the passes that he is throwing are creating big plays. And big plays is what the NFL is all about. And scoring is what the NFL is all about. And right now, the Bengals, I would say, have to be in the top three when it comes to running back, wide receiver, tight end, and quarterback collection of athletes and players playing those positions in the entire NFL. And it should be that way for the next five to six years, assuming everybody stays healthy and everybody gets paid. You're exactly right, Boomer. And to hit your point, uh, Joe Burrow has thrown 15 passes of 40 yards or more, second most in the NFL, 60 passes of 20 yards or more, fourth most in the NFL. He's got uh, 50 uh, balls of 30 yards or more, which is an NFL record. Man, or the NFL record, I should say, is 19 by Fran Tarkin. He's within four of those. He is getting the ball down the football field. 8.87 8.87 yards per attempt leads the league. 70.4 percentage uh, completion leads the league. On third down, the money down boomer. Most yards passing. He's uh, he's averaging 10.17 yards per attempt, number one in the league. Number one in the league, 72.5% completion percentage. On the money down, on the yards per attempt, everything you're talking about. It, it It's ridiculous what he's doing. I mean, he, he was looking out there. Anytime he saw one-on-one coverage on number one, Jamar Chase, he's like, I don't care. I'm going there, man. I'm going there. Yeah. You know, I, I would say that against Baltimore, Baltimore was a decimated football team. It was a JV football team out there. They really had no yep. business even being on the field with the Bengals. And the game, you know, from the Baltimore perspective, probably should have been played with all the guys that were missing. And the Bengals did exactly what they they needed to do. The next week is the real test week because it came against Kansas City. And Kansas City's defense, up until the last two weeks, the last eight weeks leading into the game against the Chargers and the Bengals, that defense had been playing great. And, of course, Patrick Mahomes and their offense had been playing great. And I remember at halftime last week I said, you know, if I'm Zach Taylor, you know, I'm throwing caution to the wind here in the second half. I, You know, I got to keep the ball away from Patrick Mahomes. I got to go for it on fourth down. And I got to play really aggressive football. And they opened it up in the second half, Dave. And I'm telling you, it was one of the best second halves I've ever seen uh, a Bengal team ever put together. And that's including mine, Carson Palmer's, Andy Dalton's, and Kenny Anderson's. I mean, it was really a clinic. And the big plays came. And here's something else that you should appreciate. Uh, It's called the Offensive Lyman's Prayer. We work the hardest. We're known the least. But who cares for we are the reason? And the the key phrase in there, we're known the least, in this case, it really fits the bill because you have Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, T Higgins, Joe Mixon, you have all these stars that are making these plays, but there's one aspect of this team for whatever reason is not getting any, uh, you know, love or any appreciation at all. And that is the offensive line and the pass protection because you can't throw the ball down the field, you know, every two seconds, you've got to sometimes hold on to it right. and then you got to let it go. And this offensive line has been playing great. The pass protection has been unbelievable the last four or five weeks. I'll tell you that this uh, this offense is is like you said. Pick your poison. Who who are you going to double? I mean, you, you got three of the best wide receivers. A, a, a trio of wide receivers. I agree. I think it's the best the league has to offer. And the guy that that is the underrated guy, C.J. Uzama, just under yeah. fifty catches, five touchdowns. And every time there's a big play, CJ's motioning across, chopping down the edge rush guy. He's motioning across, t- picking up the blitz pickup guy to take, you know, give Joe Burrow an opportunity to make plays. CJ Uzama is like the glue to the whole thing. They, they've got they've got it going on, man. They really do. They have a lot of pieces. They they're, they're putting it together. Well, so CJ is the Rodney Holman of this team. You know, Rodney was a great blocker. Yep. Rodney was an unselfish player, and Rodney always would come up with a big catch or a big play. And yep. that's what CJ is. You know, CJ is, uh, you know, he's the final piece and he is a true tight end. You know, he's not a tight end that's uh, going to catch 85 to 90 balls. He's just right. not going to, especially with the explosive wide receivers they have. You know, Tyler Boyd's another one. Yep. You know, he's the perfect slot receiver, the perfect speed guy to go down the middle of the field that kind of opens everything up. So when you kind of put it all together, Dave, and you have the threat of the run, so you don't want to play with a seven-man box or a six-man box, but you have to because you got to keep the safeties deep. You can't play one-on-one against these wide receivers. They present an enormous problem 
for opposing defenses, especially defenses that struggle to get to the quarterback. So, you know, I think it's a tough matchup for anybody moving forward, but if they play a team that is a really good running team, that could be like the Achilles heel for the, for the, uh, for the Bengals, because if the Bengal defense can't get off the field and a team can run the ball and possess the ball against them, then all of a sudden you're now playing against the Bengals the way most teams have tried to play against the Kansas City Chiefs over the last four years. And that is play keep away, which is exactly what the Bengals did to the Chiefs on Sunday. Yeah, great point. I mean, that final drive, to get the ball with six minutes and one second to play. 19 snaps later, they're kicking the 20-yard uh, field goal at the gun to win the thing. Nine plays from the one-yard line or closer to the goal. Nine snaps were run. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like that. And, uh, you know, the, the offsetting penalties, then the penalty against the Chiefs, giving the Bengals a first and goal at the half-yard line. I mean, they, and then they uh, take a knee, spike it, and kick the kick the foot. You know, I, I will say this. I will say this. We were sitting in the NFL Today studios on yeah. uh, Sunday, and I looked at Coach Cower when Zach yeah. Taylor was going for it on fourth and goal. I said, Coach, what do you think? He goes, I like it. I like it. And I said, you know, I kind of like it too. And then the reason I like it, and Bengal fans and anybody who's been associated with the Bengals understands this, you know, sooner or later, you got to, you got to get the next step. You know, you got to, you got to get over that first hump. And I think that that moment in time that Zach said, we're going, and I, he did it without any hesitation either. There wasn't a lot of discussion. Right. Uh, and it didn't work out for them, but they did get penalties and they did finally get the uh, the first and goal. But for me, just the decision to do that and to believe in his group of guys, I think is the hump that they first had to get over. They're over it now. They win the AFC North. Now the next thing is, is getting ready for whoever they play in the first round of the playoffs and finally winning that playoff game for the first time in 32 years. Yeah, I mean, to come from behind, they were trailing by 14 at three different points in that football game. Trailing by 14, down 14 nothing, down 21-7, down 28-14. They take a lead finally, 31-28. Then the Chiefs tied up, and then they win it at the gun. I mean, it, it just – it was an un unbelievable football game. And, and my, my concern is exactly what you're talking about, Boomers. I look ahead of the playoffs, I'm thinking, all right, what well, might be the Colts, might be the Patriots. What do they both do? Run the football. And that's going to be a big challenge for the Bengals. Uh, the Bengals statistically, you know, have done well against the run this season. They're going to have to really step up in the playoffs because both those teams are going to try to put you in a meat grinder. There's no doubt. Well, you know, you got to deal with uh, Jonathan Taylor if it's the yep. Colts. And then it's Ramonde Stevenson and Damian Harris if it's the Patriots. And the yep. Patriots, uh, you know, will tend to run a little bit more simply because they're protecting their young quarterback. Right. The Colts will do a lot of uh, well, a lot of play action passing out of the shotgun, a lot of bootlegs and things of that nature. And Carson Wentz, you know, he's had a good year. I wouldn't say a great year, but I think he's had a really good year. I think my buddy Frank Reich has gotten him straightened out to a certain point where they can yep. win with him now. And he's the reason why they're winning. So, uh, you know, they have a big game this weekend. You know, if they beat the Jaguars, then uh, most likely that's who they'll, the Bengals will see because I don't know what, what's going on. The Bengals, I don't think, can lose uh, the fourth seed or, or go up to the third seed because, I, I, you know, without Joe Burrow playing this week and, you know, a couple guys on the COVID list and all this other stuff, you know, this is their bye week, so to speak. And they'll be ready to go for the Colts. But if it is the Colts, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that, you know, you're going to see a lot of Jonathan Taylor to the tune of 25 or more carries. Agreed. Agreed 100,000%. Yeah, you're right. I think the Bengals have earned the right to let this be their bye, you know, because of, of clinching the AFC North against the Kansas City Chiefs. It looks like they're really not going to play any starters that they can avoid it. I mean, they can try to get everybody as healthy as possible to play in the in the football game. What's your mindset on that, Boomer? Do you think the Bengals should play some of the starters against the Browns? Do you think they should rest them all? What's your what's your knee jerk reaction to that? My personal feeling is I'd love to add to my yearly stats. I right. know it sounds selfish. Right. I know it sounds selfish, but I also want to stay in rhythm. Yeah. Um, you know, and the game's the game, you know, and uh, you take chances. And I know that, you know, if, if if Joe Burrow were to play and his knees a little dinged up and he got hurt, everybody would be going crazy in a game yeah. that really didn't mean anything. So I, I can understand a practical approach to things. But me as a player, I want to play. I want to I want to keep adding on. I want to have a I want to have a career year. You know, there what Joe has done here in the last two weeks. I mean, if he did that again, 
against a team like uh, Cleveland. Oh my God! And and threw for let's say another 450 yards or something. That'd be mind boggling. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it's not going to go. That, it's not going to go that way. But other quarterbacks will play in Week 17 and uh, or Week 18 now. And they'll put up bigger numbers and maybe Joe drops down a little bit. But, hey, nonetheless, all that really matters is that they're in the playoffs. And that's when the big games really have to start. So, Boomer, you threw 490 yards against the Rams when you were a Bengal. And that was the record until Joe just broke it. You threw for 522 when you were with the Jets. When you're in that kind of rhythm, what, what is it like? What's it like as a quarterback to be throwing the football for 500 yards or more in a football game? <laughs> It's uh, it's incredible, especially when you throw the ball 12 yards and you watch one of your wide receivers taking another 50. Right. Uh, and you while and all you're doing is seeing his number as he's running through people and around people. And uh, it's the most glorious feeling in the world, Dave. You're in a zone. Everything that you see and do is is happening in slow motion. Right. You could feel it. You could see it. It's almost like you get up to center and you know exactly what the other team is doing. And you have so much confidence in your own ability and the ability of your players around you that it's like you can't be stopped and you know you hope that that never ends <laughs> you just hope that 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 kind of takes you all the way into the playoffs and you go on a on a run that's going to be as magical as there ever has been so hopefully that will be the case for the Bengals um i don't know it's been it's been really really super impressive over the last two weeks it's really hard to put all of it into uh you know, the one twenty minute conversation because there's so many players that have done so many good things this year that we tend to uh, really focus in on the big names and, and what they've become. But Joe Burrow is everything that the Bengals had hoped he would be when mm -hmm. they drafted him number one two years ago. No question. I mean, he is he is special to say the least. So the Bengals finished the season against the Cleveland Browns. I got to ask you a quick opinion on Baker Mayfield. Obviously, he was trying to play through a very, very difficult situation. Torn labrum, fractured bone in his shoulder. I mean, he's a tough kid. There's no question about it. What do you think happens with Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns? Where do you think that ends up going, Boomer? I hope he stays there. I really do. Um, I, I, I have so much uh, respect for what he did this year, Dave. Uh, I remember my little mildly separating my right shoulder, not throwing shoulder for me. Uh, and I had to play like two to three weeks with a mildly separated shoulder. And every time I fell on it, it felt like there was a lightning bolt going through it. And it does affect your throwing. Um, and obviously we could see as the year went on, Baker Mayfield's accuracy was, was, go, was way off. I mean, it wasn't him. That wasn't the guy that was throwing. He was right. trying to throw with a torn labor, a labrum and a fractured bone in his shoulder. The fact that they let him back out on the field under those conditions, you know, I, I question that. I mean, because we as players are our own worst enemies. You know mm -hmm. that, and I know that. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we put ourselves in harm's way for all the wrong reasons. And I do think that he did put himself in harm's way, and it cost him reputationally, and it's also cost him physically. So I hope he gets a chance to stay there again next year. I don't know what the alternatives will be for the Browns. I don't know if they're going to want to trade him or bring somebody else in. But I think Kevin Stefanski does like him. And uh, I hope he comes back. I hope he's 100%. And I'd love to see him and Joe Burrow go at it for the next 10 years. I really would. So what do you remember about the Bengals' last victory in the playoffs in early, early 1991? I mean, all I know is Boomer, I was 38 years old. It's a long time ago, my man. Yes. I mean, that's like that's that's at least one generation ago. Uh, yes. What what do you remember? Oh man, uh, I remember it was the Oilers, um, uh, I, and I remember we killed them in back to back weeks. That's yep. what I remember. I remember we played them the final week of the season, and then they came back to Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium, and we absolutely drilled them. I think we put up uh, eighty points on them in two weeks. So. Yep. Yep. Um, I remember, you know, that's when Icky and JB were doing their thing. Uh, we were running the ball effectively. If I remember correctly, we had a few turnovers, um, and we just blasted them. That I don't even think uh, Jerry Glanville was not there yet. I don't think. Was he there or wasn't he there? Maybe he was, maybe he had just gotten fired. I think he'd just gotten let go. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. So he wasn't there for that one, but, um, I think it was Jack Pardee might've been the coach then. Uh-huh. 
Uh, but we still hated them. Oh God, we hated them. I, I hated them more than any team that we ever played against. <laughs> and in my entire career, I never won into that. I never went won in that dump known as the Houston Astrodome. That place was a dump and it was the worst field ever. We had never won there. And the fact that we were able to beat them uh, in week 16 and then again in the uh, first round of the playoffs uh, was extremely satisfying. That's what I remember most, Dave. So the Bengals have a home game in the first round of the playoffs. And like we said, we don't really actually know against who, but all that matters is how they play. All that matters is, you know, you can't control who your opponent is, obviously, but what you can control is how you prepare, how you play in that football game. Do, what do you remember? I, I remember my first playoff game. It's like, okay, preseason is one tempo, regular season, other than the playoffs. Wow, man, we're at warp speed now. We're on the autobahn. Man, oh, man, this stuff is fast. Was it like that for you at quarterback? Yeah, sure it was. And, uh, you know, the intensity is ratcheted up. Everybody's on time. Everybody's looking forward to go to work. Everybody's working on extra things. Uh, there were no shortcuts. Uh, whatever you were doing during the season, you try to amplify it and, and do it better, work harder at it. Um, and, then, you know, you know, Joe Burrows played in a national championship game, for God's sake. Right. So he knows all about pressure. And, you know, every game's pressurized for the quarterback in the NFL. So I, I don't worry about him at all. The only thing I ever worry about with a young team is just the turnovers and the mistakes, you know, the penalties, uh, you know, holding penalties, false start penalties, uh, too many men in the huddle penalties, you know, taking a bad time out because you don't get the play. And, you know, the coaches got to go through all the gymnastics as well as the players do. Right. So you just hope that everything is kind of smooth when you get there and you show up on game day. But leading up to it, man, there's really nothing like it. You know, this is what you – you play this game for this is the intensity that you live for and i would think that you know for the cincinnati fan the last home game was that disaster where they had the, the game won and then all of a sudden you had the the whole blow up at the end of the game with pac-man and yep. montez perfect and joey porter i believe and the whole thing was nuts yep. and they should have won that game and that's the kind of thing that you want to stay away from you know that's the kind of thing you don't want you don't want any uh, taunting penalties. You don't want to do anything stupid. You just want to play your game and beat them without giving them an opportunity to beat you. Wisely put. There's no no question about that. We'll let you get out of here with this boomer thing that people don't realize. In Super Bowl twenty three in 1988, you were playing hurt, man. I mean, you you had an injury to your shoulder. Lost Joe Walter in the last regular season game. This, this football team was playing through a lot of adverse situations. How tough was that for you to, to, for you to go through and play in an important game like that being dinged up? I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Not not for the world. So that it would have taken a broken leg uh, to get me off that field, Dave. And, yep. um, you know, you, when you get to this point now, it's a little different than what Baker Mayfield was dealing with. I mean, now it's the playoffs. Now it's the real deal. Now it's everything – that we as athletes, you know, live and die for uh, when we're living it, you know, and that's exactly where Joe and this entire team is right now. So that's how I felt back then. Um, I have no regrets. I, I laid everything I had on the line for yeah. our team, just like all my other teammates did. And uh, we just came up 38 seconds short. Unbelievable. It was, a, it was a great season, just a sight to behold, man, brings back great Great memories. I mean, that that was one hell of a football team. And you know what? It was entertaining. It was so much fun, man. It was like, just it was like, what what are we gonna see? I I can imagine you sitting there, uh, taking in the game plan with Sam and Bruce, and like, wow, hey, this is pretty cool. And you, the thing I admire about you, Boomer, is they gave you so much information. And then it was like, all right, Boomer, it's your show. Go out and run it. And you, just, <laughs> you went out and just ran the whole damn thing. I mean, it was incredible. Yeah, well. Dave, it was fun. You know, I mean, it was a lot of fun. And that's exactly what the Bengals are today. They're a fun team, you know. Yeah. Interesting thing from a national TV perspective, for the first time in a long time on CBS, you know, I could tell that our executives are really excited about the Cincinnati Bengals. Like the yep. Cincinnati Bengals right now, like the Chargers with Justin Herbert, are really like an exciting story. They're an exciting team. And it doesn't matter where you play in terms of the size of your city or your TV market. If you play and you're exciting, like Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Uzama and Mixon and and Boyd and 
the whole gamut of offensive play, playmakers that they have there, you could see that the executives here at CBS, which we cover the AFC playoffs for the most part, yep. are extremely excited about the Bengals. I mean, there's a – like, I've had to sit here for 15 years listening about the Steelers and the Ravens, Steelers and the Ravens, Steelers and the Ravens. And now, finally, we have the Bengals. And what we have is reminiscent of what we may have had back in 1988, and that is really – an explosive, exciting offense, and uh, and hopefully, you know, they can go as far as they can, you know, as they can, and and hopefully Cincinnati can finally get a Super Bowl victory. That would be awesome. Can't thank you enough. I know you're a busy man. To carve time for us means a lot. And all I can say is, who day blonde bombshell? <laughs> I appreciate it, Dave. You guys uh, have a great year, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. Brakes? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You know, yeah. you know you gotta get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out FirstStarLogistics.com.